And ladies and gentlemen, he's one of the all-time greats, my buddy, Mr. John Wayne. You're listening to the John Wayne Gritcast with me, Ethan Wayne. The hell I will. We'll be discussing the life and legacy of my father. John Wayne. Mr. John Wayne. John Wayne is the United States of America. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. Hey everybody, today we've got Dan Ford joining us. Dan Ford is John Ford's grandson. He wrote a book about his grandfather called Pappy, The Life of John Ford. His father was Pat Ford, who was a producer on The Searchers. So, uh, very connected, has some good stories about John Wayne. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, Dan. Hi, Ethan. Thanks for having me. So, Maine is no longer? Maine is no longer. You're not going no. back and forth? Well, I'm going to go. I'm, well, with COVID, I haven't been traveling much, but uh, we were going to go back this summer, but we're going to Hawaii instead. I, I want to take my grandkids back there. Yeah, okay. I'll do it next summer. It looks Maybe like, in the fall. It Maybe. looks like an incredible area. It's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, there's only one problem. There's winter, and then there's the eighth day in August, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I've, I've never been back there, but I've seen photos of it. Oh, it's beautiful. You come from a long line of, of uh, boaters. And uh, I like, have the boating disease. I, I, wonder I if, have to go to meetings, you know. <laughs> I wonder if, um, if my father you know, was introduced to boating from John Ford. Is that where his love of the ocean came from? Well, he's a California kid. He grew up uh, around, you know, he spent a lot of time around here and around the ocean, you know. No, I think he, uh, he was basically a water rat, you, mm-hmm. know, you know, from, get, from the get-go. Um, <clears throat> Ford, uh, you know, it was part of their friendship, certainly, but uh, no, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was, Doing surfing in Newport Beach long before anybody else was. You know? Yeah, I've, I've heard that. And I know he used to come down to Balboa whenever he could and go to dances at the pavilion, body surf. Um, but then, you know, I don't know when the Catalina trip started, but I've looked at some of the photos and it looks, it looks as busy in 1930 as it does today. Yeah. Just everybody, they're just all anchored. They're right. all anchored in row and everybody was was uh, looked like they were pretty ship shape and you know people were getting on the island and having a good time and enjoying it catalina is one of the one of those areas in southern california if not the only area that hasn't changed mm. avalon's gotten a little bigger yeah. since the new ownership but yeah. uh, the rest of the islands is now, if you're anchoring or you're going to the coves you're good yeah some of those uh i mean when i grew up going over there there were javelina deer buffalo everywhere sure. and they have I think they've eradicated the, the javelina and most of the deer, or they've really culled that, that herd. And um, I think they've shipped a lot of the buffalo. They probably off. had to because they have water shortages. And they've, and they've fenced always, them into certain areas. But, yeah. you know, we would hike and go right through the buffalo and see javelina or, you know, ride mountain bikes and yeah. just be surrounded by buffalo. The only difference between then and now is that there are no longer any abalone, and that's because of me. <laughs> And us, <laughs> and us. But I think there was, uh, you know, it got the abalone got slim, and then they, uh, you couldn't take it south of I think Point Conception, um, and then they introduced like they tried to plant, and then the the abalone that they planted had some kind of a disease on the foot, so that really wiped out the whole population. But I think it's actually coming back a little bit now, I think and I don't is, know if yeah. you can take them anymore. You can take them up um, in Northern California, north of the Bay Area, but you can't scuba dive. You have to free dive, mm. and you can take five. Mm. And uh, But there's a lot of poaching going on. I'm sure. There's still a fair amount of them up there, and I'm on sure. the coast of Oregon, too. Mm. Still, they're up there. Yeah, I can remember my dad sticking them to his chest, going down and sticking them to his <laughs> chest, and then coming out with abalone <laughs> on his... Delicious, you know. On his chest. Yeah, it's an acquired taste. But when I started, I didn't, you know, I I grew up on the Wild Goose. And then that ended when I was 16 or 17. He sold that boat and then he died. And then I didn't didn't have a boat until 1988. And then I got a little 27-foot power boat. The dark ages, huh? And uh, (laughs) that was, uh, I had a lot of fun on that thing. But it was Catalina. And scuba diving, just all the time, yeah. every every free free minute. 
You know, your dad was a sailor. He wasn't a cowboy. You know, that's what, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a genuine water rat. And boy, he could swim. Oh, my God. I remember seeing him as a kid swimming. He was like a torpedo going through that water. There was, a, there was an old film. It must have been up in the Sierras. Uh, well, it had to be somewhere where there was a pretty good size river. And he runs through the woods. He's really young. And I watched it maybe within the last 10 years. This is a film. This is a film. And I see him running, and he's got kind of long, wavy hair. And the way he ran, I could see the shared physicality, like the shared genetics. Because I didn't know him when he was that age. So to see him run, and then he dove into the river, and he swam under a canoe and came up on the bow of the canoe and crawled in. And I, yeah. I, I saw our connection in that. Huh. In that film clip, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, we were similar." I mean, he was a lot bigger than me, but we—I could see my movement in his movement. Yeah, it was really cool. Jack Ford was a terrific swimmer too in his younger years. Was he? Yeah. He was, How? At what year was he born? Uh, 1895. 1895. Yeah, died in '73. Well, well, I watched The Searchers the other day with Patrick, and you know, it's, it starts says Texas, 1863. And I just thought, in 100 years, you know, by 1963, we had muscle cars. So we went from, you know, fighting the Indians to having muscle cars in 100 years. And then I thought, the Wright brothers flew in 1903, and in 1967 or 9, we landed on the moon. Just really well, accelerated. accelerates, you know. Yeah. If it's, if it's not, if, but unfortunately, it's not all progress. <laughs> You know, it depends on your point of view. Well, I mean, yeah, the technology that comes out of those programs is pretty significant. And I, I feel like it's a, been a little bit dormant that maybe Elon Musk will change that. Yeah, true. Um, what, did you grow up close to Well, to you know, he was my grandfather. He wasn't my father. And oh, wait, this is... Was it your father that was a producer on The Searchers? Right, okay. Pat Ford, yeah. So this is all, I, I have no history of any of this. Well, you know the story of The Searchers. It was a true story. It was, it was based on a true story, yeah. an actual yeah. kidnapping of a girl by Comanches. And then there was a book called The Searchers that was the basis of the movie. And, and it took a few liberties. It fictionalized that. But you know, changed the time period. But it was, but was the Cynthia Ann, Ann Parker. Cynthia Ann Parker. Yeah, and there's right. a new book called Empire of the Summer Moon. Empire that, of the Summer that Moon. That looks at that, and it's a man. You know the Comanches? They were just, they were awesome. They were, they were just, first of all, I don't think that there was a pure blood Comanche such a thing. I mean, they just raided. They probably didn't really exist until they got the horse. And then they were very warlike, and they raided other tribes, you know, the Kiowas, and they were fighting amongst themselves. And they ranged from, I don't know, Kansas, Oklahoma, maybe north of Kansas, where, where, whatever's there, down through, down through Texas into Mexico. But the I, great irony to me about the, about the Comanches, if they had made a deal with the great white father, at the height of their warring with, with the white settlers, they would have been settled in West Texas, right on top of the Permian Basin. And they wouldn't be Comanches, they'd be Arabs. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, it's Because that was their range. You but know, boy, what a Mexico. warring period oh, yeah. for you know, the population that found themselves in that you know, geographic region. I mean, that was no joke. You had to be tough to, to survive that. Oh, yeah. That area and time period. I read that book. I, I think I have to you have to be tough to survive it now. You got, you got to, there's got to be a reason to be there. And, uh, well, yeah, that know, was an interesting read. Uh, so, like, when did you <clears throat> really, I mean, he was around, he was your dad. Your father was a producer. Right. And he was, working with my grandfather and then he was at Universal a long time and then he was not working with my grandfather and so back and forth you know and, I, and I mean I've heard right that John Ford was was tough and John Wayne and John Ford knew each other from you know the 20s basically and they didn't work together until the 30s all right, here it is here it is until I was about 10 years old I actually thought John Wayne's new name was god damn it duke <laughs> <laughs> You know, so what can I say? You mm. know, 
God damn it. Oh, here comes God damn it, you know. But your, your grandfather, he worked with your father sometimes. Was that a difficult relationship? Um, it became difficult, yeah. It became, I mean, exactly what happened, I don't know. Uh, basically, I think my grandfather was a very aggressive, exceptional man, a very creative man, and, uh, grumpy, hard to live with, uh, but a genius, and my father was a more normal man. Mm. My father was, you know, go along, get along, and... Uh, and uh, he, he, couldn't keep, he didn't live up to my grandfather's expectations mm. of what he should be. But, you know, it's really tough. You should know. It's tough being a, sure. a, the son of a great man. You know? Well, and it, you know, I was wondering, like, gosh, if he'd, if he'd lived another five years, how would that have affected my life just, as, just with that interaction? Because I was a teenager, and so we drifted apart, maybe. You know, I was talking to my little sister about the shootest and... Um, I don't, she was on the shootist, and there were there's photos of my whole family there, but I don't really remember being on the shootist. So I'm not sure if there was something that had happened where he's like, oh, I'm not taking that kid with me on this one. You know, I don't I don't know exactly what happened. Um, I wonder all the time. Did you, Marissa? You mean or Marissa? Yeah. Did she go on the location? She went on the location, and they, uh, you know, my dad said to her, "Gosh, you haven't been in any movies. Let's get you dressed up and get you in a scene." And so they put her in the back, but she, it never made it to the, fi the right. actual film. But we look all the time because she knows right where she was. But for whatever well, reason, I hope she that, got paid. You know. That cut got <laughs> cut out. Um, and she was really, you know, she was four years younger than I was. So she lost him when she was 13. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so was your father close to my father? No. No, I think there was a rivalry there uh, for the attention of my grandfather. Really? And, and uh, there how was. Old, how old was your father? Well, my father was born in 1921. Okay. And so my my father wrote a wrote a, an early script treatment for the Alamo, for your father, when when it was Wayne Fellows or early on, mm -hmm. and it was a treatment, and he always felt that he deserved some kind of credit for the Alamo because he did a lot of the research and a lot of the background. But, and I think that was a falling out because oh. he didn't do, but that's what, you know, writers are never happy. Writers, you know, they all fight for the screen credit because they get the Writers Guild benefits. They always fight for the, for the credit, but every movie goes through a number of writers, sure. you know. You know, it's the old joke, who is the current writer, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> Today, well, the writers have the power in Hollywood, but now, they, and back in the day, they didn't. You know, it was the directors and the stars that had the power, and the studio heads. And whoever wrote the dialogue, right? For the, for the Alamo? For John Wayne, in general. Yeah. Well, he... Was, he really, a, was really a wordsmith, and, and you know, gave those uh, lines that, that John Wayne said and made immortal. That'll I mean, be the day in... Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, some really good. Yeah. You know, I don't give jobs a higher man. I mean, there was a lot of terrific wisdom in, in the words that were spoken. And well, his. I, I think John Wayne created a character, an image um, of of himself. He created John Wayne, and he knew that this is what John Wayne would say. It may not be what he would say but it would create this persona that he had created. Mm. And all actors do that, you know, I mean, all, except the more versatile character actors. And, and <clears throat> but all stars do that, they create a, you know, I'm sure Bogart, you know, was, was, was very much that way. Mm. You know? and, and maybe certain people would, would write for them and they'd yeah, feel exactly. comfortable getting the, yeah. the words delivered from right. them. We'll always have Casablanca, you know. Yeah. Or we'll always have Paris, you know. It's funny. It's hard to put a uh, to put my finger on what you know, like The Searchers or Casablanca or some of these other really classic films. What separates that quality from what we see now? Because now we have people who are more well versed in in uh, in their disciplines and uh, a lot more production capability. But it just seems like the characters are never aspirational. They're always, 
making poor decisions and, you know, just, just, they're just in a death spiral. Like, you know, as well, soon as something all, starts. We always, you know, a hero can't be perfect. He, a hero can, can only be perfect. Well, I don't see child. the hero in, in a lot of the new things that yeah, I'm, that I I'm seeing. I agree. Um, like the hero's missing. True. You know, you, you listen to you listen to a line in a John Wayne movie or maybe something like Casablanca and it'll resonate with you for the rest of your life and it'll actually adjust your compass to, to north or help you make a decision based on that little pearl of wisdom. Well, I'm thinking of a few great movies in recent years out of Africa had a few of those. Great movie. And, you know, like, Sidney Pollack. Yeah. I mean there are came a few. up with uh, there haven't uh, been a, they haven't at least Mark Riddell. Mark Riddell, yeah. yeah. We interviewed him the other day. Yeah, the uh, the Cowboys. Yeah, yeah, good guy. Really nice guy. Yeah, couldn't have been couldn't have been more gracious. I met I met him in uh, Santa Fe when they were making it. He was uh, very gracious, very nice man. Yeah, good story. So, sorry, I got off track, uh, but I was wondering, like, when did you first sort of connect with your grandfather, and was it you well, know, was it a positive? It was very positive. And, or was and, it somebody and, that you feel like, geez, dad? You know, the John guy? Ford Stock Company was more than the, was a, an extension of the John Ford family. You know, people like the Dobie Carey and all the Careys, and, and uh, you know, they, they were always around. And there was the field photo home, and then there was the Ariner, and there was, you know, it was. What this, was the field photo home? Field photo home was a. When my grandfather made They Were Expendable in 1945, he was still in the Navy. And then MGM offered him, uh, I think, $400,000 to make this movie. So he was in a kind of an awkward position. The Navy wanted him to make the movie. MGM wanted him to make the movie. But if he accepted $400,000 while, while still in uniform, mm -hmm. he would be you know, castigated, he would be criticized. And that, that happened, actually happened to Daryl Zanuck and a couple of other people. So he created a, um, a retirement home for the veterans of his World War II unit. And it was, a, it was a farm, it was bought by, I think this guy's name was Briskin, but he was an executive at Columbia. And it was about a 10 acre spread in Reseda, right off Lindley Avenue, it was very nice. In Reseda? Where there used to be farms. Yeah, well, it was right by the L.A. River, and a lot of there were mm. a lot of there was a big a uh, lot of horses there, and people kept horses there. My father had a horse. Doby Carey had a horse. You know, a lot of people had horses, and they kept them there. And you could ride in the L.A. River, you know, and it was it was wasn't paved, it wasn't concrete, and you could ride in that whole Sepulveda Basin and then on up, and you could ride all over the valley, you know, and it was terrific. Yeah. You know? And there was a pool, and it was, but it was, a, um, it was located, it was close to Birmingham, what's now Birmingham High School was Birmingham Hospital. It was a VA hospital. And um, it, it was, you know, for a lot of disabled vets. And they had a big heated swimming pool, among other things. And for years and years and years, after the VA had relocated all those facilities down to Long Beach, and they sold the property, and LAUSD bought it, but they still had that swimming pool. So Birmingham always had the great swim teams because they had a heated pool. You know, nobody else had a pool, much wow. less a heated pool. Anyway, so these veterans would come up from Birmingham, which is located um, just a few blocks away from uh, <clears throat> from uh, the field photo home, and they would, you know, socialize. And, and there were a few permanent residents. And there was a room set aside. It was the general's room, and it was for uh, the general, uh, the the head of the OSS. Uh, what's his name? Jeez, I'm drawing a blank. But it was always set aside, and he only spent one night there. Wow. You know? But you know, um, it was a perfect place. A lot of people would go there, and for <clears throat> oh, what do you want? How do I politely say this? For uh, a little midnight romance. You know, get away from the wife, oh, you know, or if you had a fight with your wife, you know, uh, or if sleep. you wanted a place to go sleep off a drunk, 
or you wanted just to get away, or you wanted to meet a girlfriend, uh, you know, it was a lot of that went on there I too. And a lot of serious partying went on there too. I see. But they had a, a number of days, they had Memorial Day was a big day, of course. And that was the biggest day. But he had a February birthday day because his day, his birthdays was in February. Ollie Carey was in February. A couple of the other Careys were in February. Everybody, they, there are a whole bunch of birthday parties in February. So that he had a big party then. And other days, you know. I mean, it was, what happened to that property? Well, you know, over the, it was a beautiful thing and it was a great thing for him to do. And he was, he was, it basically, people grew out of it. You know, I mean, a lot of the old time guys, the, the paraplegics, well, they died, yeah. you know, or they moved on. And a lot of people that had served in that unit and were connected to it, they moved on to other careers. They moved on to, you know, they left this area. They did this and that. You know, people move on. And it kind of slowly withered. And he wouldn't let go of it, you know. He sold off part of the property, but he wanted to keep it going. And then is, was that the impetus for maybe the motion picture and television home? Well, no, but what, what he did was he couldn't sell it. I mean, he didn't own it. It was a foundation. Mm -hmm. But he transferred it, the property over to the motion picture home, and they had the chapel, and that's still at the motion picture home. It was huh. relocated to the home. Oh. And that chapel on the bench seats it has the names of everyone in that unit. And there were 13 men that were killed in World War II in that unit. And each, in that photo a, unit? In that field wow. photo unit, yeah. And John Ford was shot, right? He was wounded, yeah. Wounded, he yeah. Was, yeah. Wounded at Midway. Wow. What, uh, was he upset at John Wayne for taking the Raul Walsh job on the big trail? Do you know if that... Um, yeah. I don't think so. He thought he was so. too I green think, to take that on? Or maybe, what? maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it's kind of a big leap, you know, yeah. from... Uh, Prop man to... Yeah, really you know, I mean, you know, why don't you go work at Republic for a few years? You know? <laughs> It'd be hard to pass up the opportunity. I mean, but yeah, you don't pass up an opportunity no. like that. So that's a hell of a movie, you know. Did you? Oh my gosh! Yeah, incredible production value. Um, did you ever watch? Uh, where was I going with this? Did you ever read Each Man in His Time? No. It was a book that Raoul Walsh wrote. It was a biography. Maybe I did. But and, I, uh, I remember reading a book by him, but uh, it was interesting. His his life was very interesting. He was a character, and he, he had a patch over his eye, and he used to say, what happened to your eye? And he said, he'd say, a buzzard pecked it out. <laughs> and he told that great story of uh, John Barrymore, the last drink of John Barrymore. Oh, it's, it's a classic story. It's uh, him and Gene Fowler and all, all these, you know, Hollywood characters. Barrymore, of course, was a big drunk, you know, a big drunk drinker. So they decided they're going to go have a final drink with Barrymore after Barrymore was dead. So they went to the funeral home, they got his coffin, and they set him up in this bar where they always went to. And they all toasted him and they had a drink, you know. No, I've never heard that. Yeah, that's, uh, that story's in that book, I'm sure. Wow. The book was, uh, you know, he was like a, just becoming a teenager, I think in New York, somewhere on the East Coast, and his dad put him on a, a, a cargo ship with his uncle. And uh, he worked on that cargo ship for a couple of years and then ended up, you know, getting off in Mexico and then driving a herd of cattle north, ending up in Montana where he worked for a surgeon, you know, where they did surgeries with no anesthetic. And then he wound his way to California and stumbled onto the, the movie business. Uh, yeah, but you got to, you got to, you've got to, tr I would say probably about, I would speculate, but I would say about maybe 60% of that is true. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a few, uh, few exaggerations. All right. My, my grandfather was, was typical for that, too. You know, mm -hmm. he was. <clears throat> the story got better as time went on? Yeah, the story okay. got better as time went on. Well, my on. memories of, of John Ford, you know, are obviously a little boy. Grumpy old man. He was, uh, <laughs> he was certainly sour looking and, you know, like the, the tobacco yeah. Drill, you know, like a lot of those guys had it. And, and I remember like... The handkerchief. Was he dabbing it or chewing? What the hell did he do with that handkerchief? He, did he kind God of damn chew it? I know. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you know, I remember, you know, I remember being close to him. 
and I, I can't remember if you could, like you could smell tobacco or something. Oh, you know, oh you're going like, to his room and it just reeked of cigar smoke. You know, it's, it's it was open a window. You know, was a, he was he wasn't unpleasant to me ever. He was always like, oh, yeah, how you doing, kid? Give you like a little pat on the head or something. And Pat was his favorite. Patrick. Yeah. Pat was his boy, you know. He really liked Pat. Oh, well, Pat, well, he's a creative guy. He was an actor. And Mike used to say he didn't like me. But, you know, Mike wasn't his type. You know, Mike was, a, you know, a straight business guy, you know, mm -hmm. where Pat is, a, you know, was more verbal and more creative. Mm -hmm. He was more of a John Ford type guy. Plus, he was an actor, you know. And yeah. Michael was a businessman. It's funny. It's hard to put, a, uh, to put my finger on what, you know, like The Searchers or Casablanca or some of these other really classic films, what separates that quality from what we see now? Because now we have people who are more well-versed in, in, uh, in their disciplines and uh, a lot more production capability, but it just seems like the characters are never aspirational. They're always making poor decisions and you know just just they're just in a death spiral like you know as well, soon as something all, starts well we always you know a hero can't be perfect he a hero can can only be perfect well, i don't see child. the hero in, in a lot of the new things that yeah, i'm that I i'm seeing I agree. um like the hero's missing not get along when my father was ill and he just i can remember <laughs> going with my dad to Michael's office, and Michael had just painted the office. It was really my dad's office, whatever. Michael was running stuff. And he had some kind of an electric, you know, like little wheeler cart that they could drive around the building. You mean your dad did or Michael? Well, whoever, they had it at the office. Okay. And uh, was you know, it on like, the studio? You like lot? steered it with a bar or something, was but it you it could go down the hallways. Was I don't it? remember. I just remember being in the suite of offices as a little boy. And my dad goes, Yeah, go. You know, he knew I liked to drive things, so I hopped in this little buggy and I fucking crashed into every wall and corner in that in that office building. And I could still picture Michael going like, you know, like with every hit. And I can remember my dad kind of enjoying it. Uh, yeah. You know that, mm, whatever. Anyway, uh, real characters, real strong personalities. Yeah. Who is the story editor that worked for you? Worked for Bat Jack for so many years. Tom Kane. Tom Kane. Yeah. Tom Kane told me a story about about your father. <clears throat> Mad Magazine did one of those parody issues on westerns. Uh huh. So everybody at Bat in the Bat Jack office was reading Mad Magazine and, and it was parody on laugh on westerns, and they're all laughing. Ha ha ha! This is really funny, Michael and Tom and everybody that worked there. And then your father worked in. It. <laughs> Well, we're all doing pretty well on <laughs> making westerns. You guys knocking them, you know, and they all went in the trash real fast. Yeah, yeah. I that, I did notice that. Like, depending on you know how you walked into a room, the mood of the room, he might want to control that mood a little bit. You know, if he wasn't involved in the the laughing, you know, he might. I I find that sometimes in myself that little personality quirk. Try to try to work on it. Well, I can, see, I can see his point of view. I mean, you know. It's, yeah, but it's Mad Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what the heck? Did you spend any time on the Ariner? The Ariner was a 140-foot schooner? No, 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 110. Please. 110? Please. Yeah, please. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start exaggerating like they did. 160-footer. Oh, God. No, the Ariner Must was... Must have been 200 feet. 110 feet built in Bath, Maine, which is where Bath Iron Works is. Mm -hmm. It's where they build Arleigh Burke's destroyers and why um, the biggest employer in the state of Maine, and I've been there many times, but it was a, it's been a shipyard for years and uh, going back to the wood, wooden ship days. So it was built by, for a New York financier in the 20s who went bankrupt in the Depression. And somebody brought it out here, or maybe Ford b brought it back there, but it was a very much of an East Coast motor sailor boat. It was kind of, you know what a John Hanna boat is? No. Well, it's kind of a motor sailor with a big 
uh, cabin, cabin, you know, a big uh, deck house. Yeah. And uh, very, very functional boat. Like Captain Ron's boat, but bigger. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was kind of a... Do you remember the scene in Captain Ron? Did oh. you ever see it? Oh, yeah. I love that movie. You know, he's the captain for the... They'll get out of the kids, way. And he's taking a nap. He wears an eye patch. And so the kids go to wake him up, and the kids are like, I think he's dead. You know, whatever. And they're like, his eyes open, and they're waving over his eye, and they're like, he's dead, he's dead. And they do something, he wakes up, and then he goes, and he shifts his eye patch over to the other eye. Every boat lover to loves To sleep, he'd put the eye patch over the good eye. My favorite part is he's, his new command is this little, I don't know, 25 foot power boat, and the, the USS Saratoga is <laughs> coming out. He says, oh, they'll get out of the way. <laughs> was a, I think I watch that movie every time I go to Catalina. <laughs> It's, uh, it's permanent on my boat. That just goes on with the coffee. <laughs> uh, I know that those guys spent a lot of time on the Ariner. Yeah. And there's well, a let me tell you about the Ariner. So the Ariner came out here. He bought it. He bought it in the 30s. And during the war, he, it was turned over to the Navy, like a lot of big boats were. And they were kind of designed for offshore patrol. Coastal patrol. Coastal like patrol. That, yeah. And he, you know, Ford didn't have the money to maintain it, and he wasn't around to use it, and you couldn't get fuel, so you might as well do that, right? So after the war, there was a period from end of 45, 46 to 54, it was around, it was a Catalina. For a while, it was up at Santa Barbara, but it was mostly in L.A. Harbor, and um, Catalina, Catalina, Catalina. And I remember that as a kid. And then for Mr. Roberts, he took it down to Honolulu. Mm. And he had taken it once down to Honolulu, once in the 30s, and, and brought it back. But he took it down to Honolulu, and it was kind of good. It was this plan. That will be his base of operations while I make this movie. And I, there, there's talk and letters exchanged. Your father was down there making a, a film. And Ward Bond was down there. And Henry, it was a reunion with Henry Fonda. And they were great pals for a while. and and. You know, it was it was really ha a happy time until Mr. Roberts and Fonda had a Ford and Fonda had a falling out on Mr. Roberts, oh. but that's another story. But so the boat stayed in Honolulu, and we we kept saying we miss the Ariner. Oh, you know, yeah, <laughs> we we need to go on a 110 foot boat. So we used to go down there in the summertime. You know, my brother and I. And, uh, you know, we went first with my mother and then my mother and father, and then eventually it was just the two of us that go down there, and we got put to work, you know, we sanding and painting and, you know, and oh, stuff, little yeah. diesel mechanics, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, anyway, it was great. It was at the Alawai, <clears throat> and it was the biggest boat in, in, in Honolulu, biggest private yacht in, in Honolulu. Oh, wow. But that was a bad place for a boat like that because it was a wooden boat and that warm water, you know, the rest mm -hmm. of the story, you know. Yeah. But I, there's a great picture of all of them. I think Ward Bond, Henry Fonda, John Ford, John Wayne, somebody else down in the Sea of Cortez. Yeah. Some sailfish hanging and, you know, they're wearing some clothes that they've been in for a few days. Yeah. And uh, I was just thinking whatever year that was had to be. Pre-war. 40s, yeah, 39 to 41. 40s. In there. Just being, in, you know, I've been to see a Cortez a lot on boats and you know yeah. flying little planes, and it's remote today. Sure. But then it was really remote. I mean, Cabo San Lucas when I was a little boy, of eight, nine, ten, eleven, just a fishing village. It really grew after that. It grew during my lifetime. You know, uh, it's really but, become but a party you go town. A I'd... little bit farther, yeah, it's a party town. But if you go a little bit farther. It's, Probably just like it was. Back Guys in the I day. know that are real fishermen, you know, that want to skip the party scene. They go to La Paz. Yeah, La Paz is a great town. You know, so La Paz and Loretto. Yeah, Loretto. Uh, Mulahe. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a terrific spot. Great, great memories. Great memories. I've been spent been down there a number of times on boats and in planes and in, you know whatever. So what, what is was that a common trip for them to go? To Mexico, like would they? That's a long trip to take that sailboat or motor sailor down there. Well, it, it, yeah, but they would usually fly down. 
have a crew take it, it down and then meet yeah, it somewhere. Yeah, and you know, I mean, a lot of big yachts move. Your father's boat yeah. moved like that a lot. Yeah. you know, he. But this was, was. I mean, if this is in the the late thirties, early forties. Well, you know, I mean, he had X number of weeks or days between movies to decompress. In 1939, you know, he made four movies, you know, starting with Stagecoach, Drums Along the Mohawk, and ended up with Grapes of Wrath, and, you know, I mean, just the schedule. So the, you know, he didn't have time to, for the long trip down no, there, but um, he could fly down and, and I'm and familiar with that schedule. <laughs> yeah. I've traveled on that schedule and been left on that schedule. Yeah, yeah. He left me with Patrick up in Canada somewhere in a lake. We went in a seaplane, and then he left. I was there for weeks. Well, you, you sound like, uh, you know, you're deprived. It must have been a nice no, it was, lake. it was fun know. for me. I don't yeah. know if it was fun for Patrick. Uh, oh, we've got some business coming in here. Uh, yeah. Are we live? To, uh, are we? Uh, we're recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are we, I, you mean I can watch my language? What? Uh, you don't have to watch your language. <laughs> what? When's your? What's your first memory of John Wayne? Probably over at Catalina. Uh, and did yeah. they start a yacht club over there? Yeah, the Emerald Bay Yacht Club. The Emerald yeah. Bay Yacht Club. Yeah, yeah. It was for people who don't like for the yacht club for people who don't like yacht clubs. <laughs> And it was an outgrowth of something called uh, Young Man's Christian uh, uh, Temperance Society that was started in the in the steam room at the Hollywood uh, Athletic Club. Hollywood Athletic Club, and there was the, the the towel guy there was a guy, a black man named Buck Buchanan, and he was the president. And you know, it was basically a you know a, a joke. Uh, they would go there after f filming and, you know, sit in the steam room and, you know, <clears throat> maybe there was a barbell there that they'd take a look at. <laughs> and um, anyway, um, they used to hang out there and that group kind of grew and it was a lot of Fox people and your father and Ward Bond and, uh, you know, a couple of their buddies. Gene Markey was a uh, producer at Fox, he mm. later married Hedy Lamar, and, uh, and, uh, and then that's what turned into the Emerald Bay And that Yacht became Club the group. Emerald Bay Yacht Club, yeah. Because we have somewhere, you know, something that John Wayne or John Ford wrote to the other on letterhead for the Emerald Bay Yacht Club, right. which, I don't want to be Commodore anymore, make, I think Duke Kahanamoko had to be Commodore or something <laughs> like that, <laughs> one of their buddies. Do you remember Duke? Duke Anamoka? Yeah. Sure. Who doesn't remember a guy like that, an Olympic swimmer? You know, he was, uh, he was uh, quite a guy, you know? Yeah. Quite the man. Did you get to interact with him as a boy? A little or? bit, oh. a little bit. You know, I mean, he was down there, but, you know, when my grandfather and my grandmother seemed to be closer to the Hawaiians than my grandfather. Uh, maybe it's just because she had more time and, you know, she had a better social life down there and, uh, than my grandfather. My grandfather was on your father's schedule, yeah. coming and going. Yeah. And when my grandmother would spend a lot of time down there, during those summers we went down there, my grandmother was more often than not down there, too. And uh, she had a lot of friends down there, you know, the wise. Uh, uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> Ka Kahanamoko and, and uh, Woody Strode's wife, who was uh, who was a Hawaiian princess. You know? Oh, really? Uh, forgot her name. My God, it was his first wife. I mean, I knew Woody Strode a little bit. He couldn't have been nicer to me. Oh, he's a great guy. Really nice guy. Just couldn't have been nicer. Too like, you know, it's too bad his career person. wasn't now. You know, I mean, yeah. it's what he could have done now. Yeah. You know, he was terrific, and er anything I see him in. What a face, like what a physique. Oh, professional football player. Yeah, too. terrific, yeah. terrific looking guy. There's a book about black athletes, the first black athletes at, at UCLA, and including Jackie Robinson, Woody Strode, Kenny, uh, Kenny Washington. Uh, they, they kind of broke, California kind of broke the color barrier in, in uh, big time football, you mm -hmm. know, out here. And UCLA started it, you know. Before that, it was uh, the big schools, the Big Ten schools, they were all white, you know, except for the black colleges, you know, mm -hmm. the Gramblings, and of course, they were the best schools, you know, the best football teams. Yeah. But, you know, 
Uh, but the West Coast teams were the first to really integrate I mean, college teams. Mm. And then, of course, the Rams were the first team, being in L.A., the first team to, to really bring in black players, you know. And uh, some, of the, some of the owners resisted. And, uh, but, you know, eventually they all had to cave because that's where the talent was, you know. Well, a number of the Rams would go down or down on the Green Beret at I can't remember a couple of the guys were in it, and then some some other guys came around, and they had a terrific time. Like they all had a, a lot of fun. My dad had a. I just remember them having a good time. Who's together. a quarterback that was in one of the movies? Uh, Joe Namath. No, not not Namath. Uh, uh, the Ram quarterback. Uh, uh, Merlin Olson. Mer Merlin Olson. No, yeah. Merlin Olson was a lineman. He was a. He was. I think he was in the Green Beret. Oh, okay, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Do you remember my mother? Pilar? Um, I remember her. Do you remember a, her when she came on the scene? No, not when she came on the scene. I remember um, she was a great relief to my grandfather and my grandmother because of Chata. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, Chata was known as the Mexican jumping bean. And there was concern that, uh-oh, Duke married another Latin woman, but she turned out to be quite the nice lady. And I everybody see. was, whew, thank Chata God. was really a... Well, she was, yeah. Was difficult, she, huh? Well, not to me, but to your father, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, you know. I have no memory time, of her, really, but I remember, I just remember conversations about her. Uh -huh. you know? But I remember that, I don't remember when, you first, when I first met your mother, but I remember my, my grandparents being very pleasantly pleased. Oh, you know, that's nice to, to know. Me, to me. Polaris, 93, lives on her own. Good. Doing really well. Good. Yeah. Please give her, give her my best. Did you know Victor McLaglin very well? No, not really. He, uh, he Victor wasn't a drinker. And really? He, and oh. he, did, he wasn't a boat guy because I was told he got seasick. Mm. Victor was a horseman, though. You know, he was a hell of a good horseman, and he would he would ride in the in the in the, um, in the New Year's Day parade and the Rose Parade and things like that. <clears throat> and he had a little unit. You know, he had been in the British Army in World War One. He was the assistant World provost marshal of the city of Baghdad in the First World War. Really? Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine Baghdad then? Can you? Like, and the, what an incredible uh, and you know experience to go to Baghdad. Assistant and Provost Marshal, like, nineteen, you know, fourteen, 14? to eighteen. Yeah. Eight. He was a South African, you know. His father was a South African bishop, and then he was in the British Army, and he was, you know, a major or something. He was, but, but what a job, you know. Oh I mean, my gosh! Uh, and what an experience to go to that part of the world, and experience flavors and spices and scents and well and, traditions and being from and africa you know being growing up in that South haven't africa. gone everywhere yet you know just and i always think about that i look at Lawrence of arabia and i'm like wow what would it have been like to yeah wow to well, be out there he saw that and, and you know he came to hollywood and uh he was a you know a big he was one of those guys that was pretty well established at fox and uh, who made the transition to sound. You know, a lot of people didn't because they, their voices didn't match their looks. What was the, was it the informer, the informant? He's the, the informer, he won the Academy Award. For but a John he, Ford film, right? Right, yeah. but he was in several other Ford films and he was a regular contract player at Fox. And he got out, he went over to RKO to make the, uh, the informer. Mm. Well, great. That was Ford's uh, introduction to Marion C. Cooper. And I don't know if you, that name rings any sure, bells. Sure, it, it rings a bell. I know nothing about it. He was the producer of The, the Searchers. Mm -hmm. He was the line producer. Marion C. Cooper was an interesting guy. He was, uh, he was a, he went to the Naval Academy but did not graduate. <clears throat> he became an aviator in World War I. He was shot down several times. His, he was a prisoner of war from the Germans. I was told that a German doctor saved his life. I don't know the exact circumstances. Then he flew for the Poles against the Russians. And he was, he was 
a, quite a serious aviator. And then in World War II, he went, he became a producer. And he really made his mark at RKO because he produced King Kong. He, he had produced documentaries on, on uh, there was one called Grass, and it was, it was about the Kurds in Persia and how they would go up the mountains in the summertime with their herds of whatever they herded, cattle, I suppose, and, uh, and goats and goats and the horses and everything and you know follow the grass and then the winter time they'd go south and mm. very much like the American Indians you know the horse Indians sure. the same thing so anyway he made that film and he made one called Chang and he made one which was about a some great tiger in India and he made these adventure stories and then out of that he talked somebody into making King Kong which wow. made a fortune, yeah. you know, and it really put him on the map. And uh, anyway, so the monkey he crawls up the Empire State. That was at first, but I mean, the, the at that time, those those were all miniatures. Can you imagine? I mean, the the miniature, the work, you know, it wasn't animation. I mean, the work that must have gone into, you know, move this arm, move that yeah. arm, hold the girl, you know, on film, <laughs> and you couldn't see until it was processed. Right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, very creative, you know, it was very, uh, and a huge hit, you know. With Victor McLaglin, whether he was a lead or he was a character, he pretty much owned that screen while he was on. Oh, yeah. He was really. The only guy who could have stage him was your father. Really, really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, and the gene pool, you know, I mean, the. Uh, uh, Andy McLaglin and the two McLaglins, the Mary and Josh. Yeah. Mary and Josh. I think they're know. making uh, all the light you cannot see right now. They're working together. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're very, very successful. Oh yeah, very successful. Yeah. I met. I uh, interviewed with Josh once for a part on, for a job as a second AD on a second unit of a I don't know what Starsky and Hutch. Oh, wow. And uh, most of the stuff that they were shooting got cut out, but some of it stayed in. Mm. It was a second unit. I didn't get the job. I, I wasn't available. But I also made the mistake. I was working, I was working at a non-guild job, and I was dressed like this because that was appropriate for what I was doing. So I went out to the interview, which was at the gravel pits out in Irvine, you know, at the 605 and the, and the 210 meet, there are these gravel pits. And uh, <clears throat> so it was at dark and working at night and I walked in dressed like this, you know. And everybody else has got jeans and shorts and it's summer, you know, and it's, <laughs> everybody's dressed for, a, you know. Can, we still going? Yes. Oh, cool. We still rolling? Yeah, what, uh, World War One? Victor McGlagel in World War One. it's just, so far back. Well, Victor was, uh, The Quiet Man was, I think might have been the last movie he made. Really? I know it was, a, it would have been the last physical role he played, you know. I mean, he was, I know he was up in years for that. So, but if he was in World War I and he was, a, say, a major, he would have had to have been 25, 30. Okay, wait, and, tell and me again where he was. He was the... Assistant Provost Marshal, which is the, the assistant MP, military policeman, in Baghdad in World War I for the British Army. Wow. And the British Army occupied uh, uh, that, what, 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 what be, before that was Iraq. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. But it was occupied by the British because the British BP Petroleum hit a huge oil strike just before World War One, and they hit it right down at the at the mouth of the uh, at the top of the Persian Gulf in Persia. It was Ottoman territory, and the British grabbed it because they wanted the oil to convert to to, to fuel their ships. They had just were just in the process of converting from coal to steam, you know, coal to turbines, and they needed oil. Before, they had plenty of coal. They have plenty of coal in their own country, but suddenly they needed oil. So they could get it from the Western Hemisphere, but easier to get it from, from Persia, which was closer, you know. Wow. And that was the first, there's a, there's a, 
<clears throat> there's a great book called A Prize, and it's, it's uh, by a guy named Jurgen, and it's a history of the, it's the 20th, it's the, it's the history of the 20th century, and it's about the oil industry mm -hmm. and the big strikes. And the same guy who found that strike in, in Persia found the big, big oil in Venezuela. The same, the same driller, you know. Uh -huh. So he had a real talent, a real nose yeah, for oil. Yeah, no kidding. You know? And can you imagine just like Persia back then would have been. And then, and the British Petroleum was wholly owned, subs, wholly owned by the British government. And it was, they wanted it, and they controlled it, and they wanted to control, and they controlled Persia at the breakup of the Ottoman Empire because that's where they got their oil. Mm. And there was no oil in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. They hadn't found it until after World War II. So, you know, they suspected it was there. And, uh, but they, it, was, it was coming from Persia. Was your father in the military? He was in the Navy, yeah. He was a, a public information officer, I which see. was a PR kind of a job. Yeah. He and was, then how did uh, John Ford actually go in the service? As John, a young Ford man? Be, John Ford became a Naval Reserve officer in, in the mid 30s. And I'm not sure why uh, my grandmother used to say it was pressure from me because he, he felt that this would be the mark of a gentleman to be a Naval officer. Mm. And you know, I mean the Navy and the military, they, they have reserve officers in different, with, with different expertises, you know, lawyers, doctors, dentists, uh, so on. And so filmmaker is a logical choice because that was the <clears throat> uh, educational medium of the time. You mm. know? So they would, you know, it made sense for them to hire Hollywood professionals, you know, and, and become reserve officers. So how old would he have been in the 30s? Well, he would have been 35, 40 years old in 1935. Okay. So, yeah. But, you know, for a direct commission, and he was a, I don't know, lieutenant commander, which is an old four. Just goes right in like that? Yeah, it just went in right in. Well, most of those guys who direct commission, maybe they teach him, you know, go down to San Diego and take the weekend and learn how to salute or something. You know? I see. You know, say, you know, port and starboard and fore and aft and. You know. <laughs> and what was the was there a beef between John Ford and John Wayne over military service or? Well, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> people criticized your father for not serving in World War II, but you know the man had four children, and what's he going to do? Go on as a private? You know, he's got four kids in school, he's got a wife. I mean, what do you do? You know. Uh, I don't know. I've heard he was older. He was over the age, but he but was a lot over of guys the minimum got age. Some kind of a job to do, like you say, John Ford went in. He's a well, Ford was he's kind of a military, you know, a military nut anyway. You know, mm. before long before World War II. I see. You know, he was, he was, and he got it from my grandmother, who came from a, who came from a family, a military family. And then I also wonder, like, who would want to give up that recruiting tool of John Wayne making. War movies. Well, that's that's, and he went on bond drives. You know, I mean, he did what he could do. You know, I mean, a lot of them did. You know, Bogart did, and you know, I mean, and uh, um, you know, they all did. Mm. You know, they contributed in some way. In the Hollywood Canteen. You know, yeah. I mean, no, no, I know they, I know they did things, and they, they gave their time and energy. Yeah. And, and uh, everybody, a lot of those guys joined that effort to support sure. it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if there's any more between. I think those there was two. probably your father was making so many war movies that the government said, "Well, you know, he's <laughs> such propaganda recruitment value. He's more valuable in Hollywood. Mm. You know, why push it?" You know. Well, pretty much every military guy I talk to says that he's responsible for them signing up. <laughs> When so I was when I was in the army, when I was in basic training, you know, they're teaching us to throw hand grenades, things like that. And you say, "Who do you think you are, John Wayne?" You know, I mean, you always got that everywhere you go. What do you think you are, John Wayne? How do, it's not a hole of goddamn rifle. You know? Quite, uh, quite an impact. <laughs> so, yeah. What um, do you have any like specific memories of him? Of Duke? Yeah, thing that sticks out. Well. Uh, mostly, yeah, interviewing him with the book. 
um, uh, spending time with him, him finding the time when he was sick, and him camouflaging the fact, going down there and, you know, extensive interviews I did with him for the book. And, uh, <clears throat> and then on the set of Cowboys, my grandfather went out there. Um, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Were you out there? Yeah. I yeah. was 10, 10 years old yeah. or something like that. It was great. And yeah. were you in that house that uh, he lived in with the yeah. two hippie chicks? Mm -hmm. with, uh, with the writer? Yeah, the, uh, the guy from the Times. Yeah, so. Wayne Warga. Wayne Warga, yeah. He was there. And he, the Duke had, was driving along this highway in New Mexico in, in his Pontiac, you know, raised roof station wagon. And there's two hippie chicks hitchhiking, you know, which was pretty common at the time. So he stops, he picks him up, and he says, you girls want a job? <laughs> and they kind of said, doing what, you know? I said, well, one, I need a cook and I need a house cleaner, keeper, you know? Okay, you know, so. So that's where they came from. That's where they oh, came from. Oh, I didn't from. know he that. He picked them up hitchhiking. You know? It's funny, it's something in town, like some kind of a thing, and a guy comes up to me, because, you know, I'm going to tell you, tell you a story about your dad. I was 16 or 15 and I'm trying to get down to Corona Del Mar and I'm hitchhiking on PCH and the station wagon pulls up and it's your dad. And he not only took me down there, but he drove me right to the, you know. My dad or my granddad? No, my dad. Oh. My dad picked him up and took him and so it was just another hitchhiking story. Oh, yeah. So he gave rides, evidently. Yeah, he did. I have, yeah. a, I have a guy I grew up with who had a flat tire and didn't have a spare and was trying to figure out what to do and your father stopped. And he says, he put the tire in his car, took it to the gas station, stood around till they fixed the tire, drove him back, helped him change the tire. And this is a kid, you know, this guy is 18 years old. He's a freshman yeah. in college. I guess it was oh. because he was a freshman at USC. Oh, maybe. <laughs> maybe he spent a little extra time with them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he, did, he, he would do things like that. Yeah. Did you ever get on the Wild Goose? Several times. Yeah. Oh, cool. It was great. Yeah. Had that Rennick furniture, right? That yeah, one. Rennick painted the uh, that big mural. I think that was the guy's name. Am I right or wrong on Avery that? Avery Rennick was a furniture maker that uh, your dad and Ward Bond and my grandfather and my Aunt Barbara, they all used him. No, Ray Kellogg, I'm sorry. Ray Kellogg. Ray, what was Ray Kellogg, a set Ray director? Kellogg was a uh, special effects guy and uh, um, a second unit director. He was, uh, he, he did a lot of work on Torah, Torah, Torah. Mm. And he was in my grandfather's unit in World War II. Oh, wow. And he did a lot of the, the special effects. There was, uh, in the main salon on the Wild Goose, there was a, a big sort of couch padded thing, like a really deep couch that you could oh. lay flat on with a bunch of pillows around. They called it the hickey -a. And uh, on the side wall and on the back wall and on the side was a, you know, naval battle of, uh, you know, sailing ships. Uh, and I'd, I'd be interesting to know what, what battle that was that was painted on there, but Ray Kellogg was the, I remember him painting it as a little boy. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know he, I didn't know he was a painter too. But Rennick, now that you mentioned that. Furniture uh, maker. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that on the back of, uh, of pieces of furniture that we have from him. Yeah, I still have a few pieces. Yeah. Rennick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it used soft wood. But yeah, but it, the stain is terrific. Hmm. Yeah. What uh, what else jumps out of your brain? And well, you know, I knew him as a young man knows uh, um, an older man, and uh, and I knew him like I knew my grandfather was somebody always in motion. You know, somebody always on his way here, going there. Um, <clears throat> I didn't have much contact with him between, uh, you know, uh, the time I left high school and until I got back into television and uh, got in the Army and I would run into him once in a while at NBC. He would be on that Laugh-In or yeah. he'd do those shows and, you know, it was always high, very friendly, you know. Mm. And he'd, he'd, we, I worked on The Tonight Show and we had a bar in the backstage and we had a prop box. It was actually, it would look like a prop box, but it was actually a bar. And you'd open it up, and it had all the accoutrements you would find in a bar. 
So whenever he was there, he would often stop. <laughs> and open the box. Walk in <laughs> and make himself a drink. He wasn't the only one. It was Dane Martin and Frank and a lot of people. They all, you know, and the producers are laughing. Uh, the two guys, I forgot their names. Rowan and Martin. No, not not the actors, but the. Uh, Wasn't it Rowan and Martin's laughing? Yeah, they were the they were the, the they the were stars. the on stage guys, but the producers were uh, were a team, and they did Dean Martin and they did a lot of stuff, and hmm. they were friends with your dad, and they would get they would con your dad into uh, <clears throat> into making doing walk ons. Yeah. And, and he used to love to do it. You know, he would like to do the walk-ons and laugh-ins. And his idea of a walk-on, he'd walk through the wall. You know, he'd walk through, you know, a prop wall. We still have a script cover from Laugh-In, and it's really a cool and unique piece. Cool. Um, well, gosh, But thanks. he was around NBC a fair amount, you know, so. Yeah. Thank you, Dan, for your time and your stories. What's the correct title of the book you wrote about your grandfather? Happy, The Life of John Ford. Happy, The Life of John it's Ford. It's out of print, unfortunately. Well, you can still find it. Yeah, just like uh, each man in his time for Roll Walsh, you know, you can yeah. you can track them down. It's if it's something you have interest in, it's worth looking it up. Well, I think about I think a, a lot of the like Raoul Walsh's Raoul Walsh, Mr. Walsh's book. My some of my stories are <clears throat> probably a little exaggerated. Well, <laughs> they're legends, you know, yeah. that they're passed down through time. Well, you, those, you've heard a few of those. Those guys have had big lives. Had great lives. Well, thanks to be a pioneer in that, that business. You know? Yeah, I appreciate you coming down and talking to us and sharing all the stories. Por nada, amigo. Yeah, yeah. I've still never been to Maine, but I've seen the photos, and it looks like like a nice place to go to have after a boat. La go after Labor Day. Yeah, and 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 charter, charter. Get a crude charter Hinkley yachts out of uh, the Southwest Harbor, which is in the in the. Uh, <clears throat> Bar Harbor area, mm -hmm. you know, do that or, you know, do your own thing, you know, just go there. No, I think I'd like to, I wouldn't mind go chartering. Go in the fall. Go in the now, fall. whenever I use my boat, I'm like a slave to anybody else who's on the boat, you know, driving, washing, anchoring, putting the dinghy well, in, you, fixing this. First of all, you're in, in strange waters. Yeah. So if When you, I got my captain's license, it's a lot of it. The well, charts are East Coast charts. But there's things that are different there. First of all, you know, you, you're... you're your variation. compass deviation, yeah. variation is is backwards, because you you know you're on the other side of the country, you know, and just and the tides, you know, yeah. there's nothing like here, you know. I mean, they're 10, 15 feet, you know. You got to be careful, and lobster traps, goddamn lobster traps everywhere. everywhere. You never take your eyes off. Of <laughs> you know, boom, you're hitting a lobster wow. trap. You're always going, no matter what you are. That'd be nice to see one day. You got to do it. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much for listening to the John Wayne Grit Cast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you like what you heard, give us five stars in the Apple Podcast app and follow us on social media at John Wayne Official. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go.